Hey, happy Monday, Met fans. How are we all doing? Happy Monday? Yes. Any day we can talk Met baseball is a happy Monday. I'm so glad you guys came aboard today. Uh, what's there to talk about in Met land today? Well, as always, we're still looking for a general manager or director of baseball operations, as the kids like to call it today. And it looks like it's wash, rinse, repeat for what's happening in Metland. And is that a good thing? Once again, all our top candidates, just like last year who we were considering, look like they're going to fall by the wayside. Looks like Theo Epstein flat out denied the Mets in a matter of less than 24 hours. Uh, David Stearns, once again, looks like he is irreplaceable as far as the Milwaukee Brewers are concerned. So nothing's going to happen on that front. Uh, the Billy Bean thing is still floating up in the air, and now the odds of him actually taking the job seem to be decreasing. And I think the deal with Billy Bean there is he's actually, I think, 4% ownership. He has 4% ownership in the Oakland A's, and uh, he is leaving a behind a pretty hefty compensation package if he comes to the Mets, so I'm not sure. Although I could see him coming with Sandy Alderson, but you would think something would have happened by now. So once again, it looks like we're going to have to go for a fourth or fifth best, best option here. And uh, you hate to say it, but the longer this drags on, the tougher the offseason is going to be for the Mets as far as their goals and what they want to do as far as a manager and what they want to do as far as uh, player personnel. So it's going to drag on, and that's not a good thing. Uh, but we'll be here to talk about it on a daily basis, so stay tuned. It's going to get interesting. Once the playoff ends and all the attention's away from the games, that's when the serious business starts. And usually sometimes during the playoffs, things are happening, but they're just not announced due to the fact they don't want it to be a distraction. The show, uh resignation or firing, whatever you want to call it in St. Louis, actually was announced on game day, which is the rare exception. But usually these types of transactions aren't announced until the playoffs are actually over. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in that regard. Uh, I, again, I'm confused. I don't know what's going to happen with the director of operations. Uh, it looks like it's not going to be Stearns. It looks like it's not going to be Billy Bean. Uh, although Billy Bean is still a candidate, let's not give up hope on that. Where there's smoke, there's hope. And uh, it'll be interesting. Now, I, I'm not sure who the gentleman is with the Los Angeles Dodgers organization, but the Mets seem to have their eye on him. We'll see what happens once the playoffs end. Like I said, it hasn't been the dream role so far with the Mets in the general manager's hunt. So we'll see what happens. But we know what happened in 1973. The Mets pulled off one of the greatest postseason runs in history and one of the greatest months of September in history. In reality, they were only a 500 team, but they didn't make it to the National League Championship Series. And one of the big games in that fight to get to the World Series was the 1973 Game 3 of the National League Championship Series. That was held at Chase Stadium. And with the series tied at one game each at as 53,967. Remember when Shea used to pack them in with those numbers? City Field's a little bit smaller in dimension, but Shea used to get 55, 56,000 back in the day. Well, they all came out to Shea Stadium, fired up, and it was a beautiful afternoon, beautiful autumn afternoon, a Monday afternoon, just like today. So we can just vision what it was like then today just by looking out the weather and just pretend it's 1973 and you're at Shea Stadium at Flushing by the Bay. Now, it'd been just four years since the very first NLCS in history was played here at Chase Stadium. Yes, the Mets were part of the first NLCS ever in 1969 when they played the Atlanta Braves. And uh, that year, they did advance to the World Series, and they did win the World Series. And now we were hoping for the same thing in 1973. And Met fans were leaving. There was a lot of excitement in the air. Now, there was a lot of pregame trauma. During batting practice, the Reds' Joe Morgan approached Bud Harrelson in the batting cage, commenting on the remarks Harrelson made after game number two. Harrelson told the press the Reds look like him out there hitting. Morgan grabbed Buddy by the jersey, saying, if you ever say that about me again, I'll punch you. The Mets' rusty stop intervened. How many guys know this story? 
He knew Morgan since their days together in Houston with Astros. Morgan cooled off after talking with Staub, apologizing to their Mets teammates. Morgan said that Pete Rose is not going to be as forgiving and will use the comments to try to fire up the Reds team. And boy, I guess Pete Rose was fired up. <clears throat> now, back in the days, the Mets were owned by Mrs. Joan Payson, and she, she threw out the ceremonial first pitch, and it was game on. Now, today's starters, it was a good matchup, always a good matchup when you have Jerry Kuzman out there. He was a tough luck pitcher in 73, was under 500, 14, and 15, but in typical Kuz fashion, he had 2.84 ERA, 156 strikeouts, 12 complete games, and three shutouts. Now, since mid-August, he was 6-1 and one with a 1.16 ERA in that time. So Kuz was clutch when it counted in 73, including a, setting a met record for scoreless innings during that stretch. Now, for Sparky Anderson's Reds, it was Ross Grimsley, 13-10, and 3.23 ERA with 90 Ks and eight complete games in the regular season. And yes, indeed, friends, it was memorable afternoon. In the home first with two outs, Rusty Staub started his big day at the plate by putting the Mets on the board with a solo home run. Cleon Jones then singled, but was stranded when John Milder made it out. Now, Kuzman retired the first six batters he faced. In the Mets second, Jerry Grody, our favorite catcher, led off with a walk, and center fielder Don Hahn singled to right. Bud Harrelson then lined out to right for the first out. The pitcher, Jerry Kuzman, also singled, but Grody was unable to score as the bases were loaded. Now, Wayne Garrett flew out to center, but this time Grody did score, and it was an RBI sack fly, and all was good in Metland as the Metsies were winning three to nothing. Now, Felix Mian, who had set a Met regular season record that year with 185 hits, single to right, bringing in Hahn with the fourth run. Sparky Anderson was done with Grimsley and brought in Tom Hall, 8 and 5 with eight saves, 3.47 ERA to face stop. Now, as you recall, Rusty was the Mets' biggest run producer of the year and one of their most clutch hitters. His 76 RBIs led the team, and his 15 homers were third to John Milner. The Hammer had 23, and Carrot Top Wayne Garrett had 16. Hall delivered the pitch, and Staub blasted down the first baseline, and the ball hit off the auxiliary scoreboard for a three-run homer. The Shea crowd went crazy as Staub quickly rounded the bases. Reminded me of that old Mickey Mantle trot. It just put your head down and run around. And it was now 6-0 New York. Now, Stop had already hit a homer in game two and now had his second homer with his fifth RBI and was batting 300 in the playoffs. In the top of the third, Dennis Menke hit a solo homer off Kuzman, putting the Reds on the board. After Daryl Cheney popped out, Larry Stahl, Pete Rose, and Joe Morgan hit consecutive singles. Morgan's hit brought home the Reds' second run, and it was now 6-2 New York, and since he was a knockin'. Now, in the bottom of third, Reds left-hander Dave Tomlin, one and two, one save, 4.88 ERA on the year, replaced Hall on the mound. He was greeted with a Jerry Grody base hit. He would advance and score as, believe it or not, Jerry Kuzman singled to right field. Even the Kuz got in the hitting spree. Kuzman had a, one point, a point one oh three at batting average, or I should say 103 batting average in a regular season with three RBIs. In his 12-year Met career, he batted 121 with two homers and 39 RBIs and 87 at-bats. At -bat but today, he got the big hit. And then the fourth inning, Felix Mion drew a walk and one out. Cleon Jones doubled the right field, bringing Mion home. Next to Hammer, John Milner drove a hit to right to make it 9-2 New York, and Shea was going bonkers. From the dugout, Tom Seepers was keeping close watch on Pete Rose. Jerry Kuzman claims he got Rose fired up earlier in the game. Rose knew Kuzman was a hard thrower at the time, but he was trying to keep the ball down and away with slow curveballs. After his first at-bat, when he popped out, Rose got back to the dugout yelling, Kuzman, throw the ball, you big dumb donkey. Kuzman heard him over the noisy crowd, but Kuz never looked over. When Rose came up later, Kuzman tried to drill him with four fastballs four times, but Rose got away each time, so you can see the tension was building. Tom Seaver called, you know, somehow, somewhere, Pete was going to do something. Now, Kuzman almost hits Pete Kuzman with a pitch, and I thought to myself, he's going to go at, at, to the mound after Jerry, Seaver said. He started on the grass, and then he came back to the baseline and went directly to first base. Now, in the fifth inning, Rose got aboard with one out. The next batter was Joe Morgan, who grounded to Mian into a 3-6-3 double play, completed by John Milner at first base. At second base, 
Pete Rose went in hard with a pop-up cheap shot slide into shortstop Buddy Harrelson. The two exchanged words. Harrelson called him a cheap shot. Beep, 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 sucker. It was what Rose wanted, and he grabbed the skinny Harrelson by the top of his jersey and threw him to the ground, jumping on top of him. In the board of Mets announcer Bob Murphy, Rose outweighs Harrelson by about 35 pounds. The overall reaction was Rose was acting like a big bully, picking up on the much smaller, picking on the much smaller shortstop. Met third baseman Wayne Garrett came over from his third base spot, chopping on top of Rose to try and pull him off Harrelson. Then all hell broke loose at Chase Stadium, on and off the field. It was the third out of the inning, so players were on their way to the dugout, focused on jogging away from the field. When everyone realized what was going on, both benches empty, as well as the team's respective bullpens. There was a lot of pushing, shoving, and milling around in the infield for a bit. Then Reds reliever Pedro Borbone landed a sucker punch from behind to the head of Met pitcher Buzz Capra. Capra attacked Borbone as backup catcher Duffy Dyer got in some retaliatory punches of his own before he'd been pulled out of the melee by Willie Mays. As Borbone left the field, he picked up a cap and put it on his head, thinking it was hit. his. To the crowd's delight, <laughs> this was getting crazier by the minute. It was a Mets cap. When Bourbon finally figured it out, he pulled it off his head and took a bite out of it, then threw it down. It was Bud Cap Buzz Capper's met cap, and he claims to still have it to this day. When order was finally restored on the field, the game continued with Rose returning to his position in left field. But now it was chaos in the stands, especially overlooking left field. The Shea faithful let Rose know how they felt, and they weren't nice about it. The scene was gotten very ugly and dangerous, and as Met fans let Rose have it. A variety of subjects, objects showered down from the upper deck, anything from papers, programs, hot dogs, beer cups, batteries, and finally, finally, a whiskey bottle. It got that scary. And the bottle landed just a few feet away from Rose, just missing his head during Felix Milan's at bat. Rose showed the low class he had by actually tossing some stuff back. He never, never thought he could have hurt an innocent child or innocent bystander. But times were different in 1973, and no action was taken against him. Rose called time and walked toward the infield, informing umpire Ed Sudol and his manager Sparky Anderson. The Reds manager Sparky Anderson went to the umpire to stop the game, claiming it was too dangerous for his team on the field. The Reds were pulled from the field. Anderson said Pete Rose gave too much base to baseball to die in left field at Shea Stadium. The umpires met with NL President Chubb Feeney, who was in attendance at the game, and came to a decision that the game may have to be forfeited unless order was restored in the stands. At risk of losing a playoff game in which they had a 7-1 lead, the Mets sent a peace delegation to left field. Tom Seaver, Rusty Stomp, Cleon Jones, and Yogi Berra pleading with the Rowdy fans to calm it down. New York fans cheered as their team walked out to left field and obeyed their request. Cleon Jones said the Fed and fans hadn't seen Willie in quite a while, and we're happy to see him. At first, the team brought Barra and Mays, and that would be enough. Even NL President Chubb Feeney agreed. He thought if he went out there, they'd throw things at him too. He even considered sending Tom's wife, Nancy Seaver, out there as a peacemaker, since she was so loved as New York. She was like the first lady of New York baseball. Feeney said he thought of it, but didn't know where she was sitting. Now, order was soon restored enough to continue the ball game. Pete Rose booed mercifully upon his return to the field. From that day on, it would be that way for him at Chase Stadium. And for Met fans like myself, some have never forgiven him. I have, but some to this day still have not forgiven him. But Harrelson instantly became America's favorite little guy, the underdog hero. And uh, America picked up on it. Harrelson was already an all-star shortstop because of its outstanding defense. This in an era when shortstops were small guys who were not known for hitting. Harrelson was among the best of the lot. Any Mets pitcher of his era always said Harrelson stopped many huts, hits from getting through and was the anchor of the infield in 69 as well as 73. Now the Mets rolled to a 9-2 victory. Kuzman went to distance another fine postseason performance. His third career postseason win without any losses. He allowed two earned runs on eight hits without any walks. A long way he struck out nine reds, including rookie Ed Ambrister, three, Armbrister three times. Offensively, it was Stobbs' day, too. He had two hits, both homers and four RBIs. John Milner, Felix Mion, and Kuzman himself all had hits with RBIs. 
Wayne Garrett added an RBI, and Don Hahn and Cleon Jones both had two hits apiece. Now, the Mets took a 2-1 lead in the championship series on their way to a World Series and another pennant. And what a year it was. And you have to admit, that was one crazy ride at the time. I don't know how many guys were around when that happened. I was 12 years old at the time. And to this day, that game reminds me of everything of craziness of that 73 season. It was unbelievable. What else is unbelievable? Well, we celebrate five birthdays today. Uh, Garrett Olson, who pitched with us in 2012. And if you remember Garrett, look at these stats. He only pitched one third of an inning with us. But you know what his career ERA as a Met is? 108. Yes, 108. Garrett Wilson was a pretty good pitcher with the Orioles and Marin Mariners and Pirates, but his Met career, that ERA is astonishing. He wore number 38, and it's his birthday today. So happy birthday to Garrett Olson, who turns 38. Happy birthday to one time former winner National League Player of the Week Award, Yoenis Cespedes, one of the biggest trades the Mets pulled off. And he did it all and for the Mets in 2015 as he led them to the World Series as they were nationally champions. And in 2016, he led up the joint. He met, led the Mets in home runs with 31, RBIs 86, slugging percentage 530 on base percentage with 354, OBP with 884, total basis 254. Uh, he did it all. Unfortunately, that was it for Ioannis as far as like highlights. Uh, he was with us in 2017, 18, and 20. 19, you remember, he got hurt, and he was never the same, and he kind of dogged it once they offered him the big contract. The Mets were almost left in a position where they had to sign him to save uh, franchise face. His Mets fans loved them, but the, it was one of the worst contract signings of all time. But we do remember Ioannis for what he did for us in 2015 and 2016. Uh, also celebrating a birthday day is Kevin McGowan. 2017, he pitched eight games for us with a 5.19 ERA. All his uh, appearances were in relief, and he wore number 61. Happy birthday. He turns 30 today. Uh, happy birthday to Andy Hassler. Wore number 44 with the Mets in 1979. Pitched 80 innings. Uh, got a lot of work with the Mets, 3.70 ERA. Started uh, eight games. He was a crafty left-hander, as they like to say. Uh, happy birthday, Andy. He turns 70 today. Wow, time is flying. Happy birthday to Alex Cora. Uh, Alex, yeah, not Joey, Alex. Uh, he was with us in 2009, 2010, two years combined, had 448 bats, batted 234. Uh, good utility ball player for us. He wore number three and number 13. It's his birthday today. So happy, happy birthday to Alex Cora. Uh, what else has happened on this day in Met history? Well, on this day, a big trade. If you're an Art Chamsky fan, the Mets traded Art Chamsky, Rich Fokers, Jim Bibby, and Charlie Hudson to the St. Louis Cardinals for Jim Beecham, Harry Parker, Chuck Taylor, and Tom Couter, Couter on uh, this date in 1971. And on this date in 2011, the Mets purchased Elvin Ramirez from the Washington Nationals. Uh so that's kind of the stuff that's been going on in, in uh, Metland here. Uh, what other stuff have we been talking about in the group itself? We asked, who would you like the Mets to hire as baseball president of uh, baseball operations? And uh, Ron Kaplan said he's available. And you just might be considered Ron Kaplan. And Jerry Plunkett had the best answer when he said he was still alive, Gene Michael. Now, uh, Jerry knows that Gene Michael was the architect behind those big teams in the Mets. Then I asked, how would you score Sandy's career, Sandy Olson's career with the Mets, five being the highest and one being the lowest? The average score was three. So Sandy's uh, fallen down a little bit in the approval ratings. Uh, what else did I mention in the group, or what are we talking about? We always talk about good things. Uh, but well, one of the things we're talking about is Brett Beatty and him lighting up the Arizona four league with a OPS of 1,417. You go, Brett. The future is bright with you. And then we threw out this interesting stat in the 1999 Robin Ventura Grand Slam single game. The bullpen was the real hero of that game. They pitched 12 innings, nine hits, one earned run, and 16 strikeouts. They came through big time. 
Uh, and don't forget, if you're not a member of the baseball group, New York Mets Baseball Way of Life, please do join. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Feel free to leave a comment. And if you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe. We'd love to have you aboard as a regular subscriber where all our shows are archived. And if you ever need to reach out to me, I'm at P-H-I-L-S-T-A-N-4-1 at gmail.com. Now, what else do we normally do? I'll tell you what else we normally do. We normally go ahead at this point and give you the Met Trivia and Jeopardy question of the day. Who's ready? Okay, here's today's Met Trivia question. Who was the winning pitcher in the Mets 8-5 win in the seventh game of the 1986 World Series? Today's Jeopardy, two clues, traded by the New York Mets to the Chicago Cubs with Johnny Stevens in exchange for Bob Henry on June 12th. 1957. Second clue, after getting off to a 2-0 start in 1966, he lost his next six decisions and was moved into the bullpen. He earned his first major league save July 26 against the Astros and finished the season at 4-8 and eight with a 5.12 ERA. I need to give you guys some time to figure out this one here. And uh, let me get a sip of my coffee with my New York Rangers cup. By the way, if you want to watch a little baseball and hockey tonight, the Rangers play the Maple Leafs tonight. That's always a good one. They continue their Canadian swing out there. But now back to the nitty gritty. We're going to give you the two answers. Uh, again, the Met trivia question today was who was the winning pitcher in the Mets 8 5 win, the seventh game in 1986 World Series? Why it was none other than Roger McDowell. Congrats to Tom Ragone on being the first to submit the correct answer. Way to go, Tommy. And then the Jeopardy question was the two clues. Traded by the New York Mets, the Chicago Cubs with Johnny Stevens in exchange, Stevenson in exchange for Bob Henley on June 12th, 1967. After getting off to a 2-0 start in 66, he lost his next six decisions and was moved into the bullpen. He earned his first major league save July 26 against the Astros and finished the season at 4-8 and with a 5.12 ERA. Who has the answer? Well, the answer is, who is Rob Gardner? And congrats to our West Co- our favorite West Coast Met fan. What a knowledgeable. And did, hopefully one day he'll show his collection to the group one day, but he is an avid collector. He's got quite a Jacob DeGrom collection. And uh, congrats to David J. Rubin on being the first to answer today's Met Final Jeopardy. Well, that's going to wrap up another episode for today. I want to thank all you guys for watching. Uh, It really means a lot to me. We'll be back tomorrow in another broadcast. Until then, keep that hot stove hot and let's keep talking Mets. Talk to you tomorrow, guys.